Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. Andrew, hello. Are you excited? I'm very excited. We've got a a really good programme, I think, today, one of our best, uh, about another scandal and another cover-up. And uh, And another country, another continent, another hemisphere. Can you see? Can you see? Have the Sydney, uh, I would say Harbour Bridge, have the Opera House lit up. (laughs) Right, very good. To add to a theme. And look, a little clue about what we're talking about. All our expensive props. But also an issue that plays into something of great interest to me. I'm sorry. (laughs) I <laughs> know oh, you, you can't take me seriously at all, even on the best of times. So, sorry, yes, and in, uh, a subject that is of interest to both of us. Go on. Well, I mean, I think it has wider ramifications about the question of royal records and what should be open and and how those could be opened. Uh, and I have a great deal of admiration for Jenny Hocking because she's achieved a, a real breakthrough in terms of of making records available to scholars. She has, and I'm hoping she might tell us a few things that will surprise us and maybe even um, shake the news agenda in Australia because of the work she's been doing. I should say, though, just as ever, we're rushing ahead. We're talking about one of the great scandals uh, of Australian political history, which directly involves Britain and Britain's ruling royal family. It's the dismissal of the Gough Whitlam government in November 1975. And I don't think many people in Britain actually know much about this story at all. Do you think? No, the, uh, they don't. I think it's it's uh, it, it really wasn't covered here much, uh, and it was only really because of her investigations that, in some ways, we we now remember it. And I think those people who don't know much about Australian history, I should do a little bit of a primer. I should explain. Also, I I came to I know you know Jenny through your joint interest in royal documents and getting hold of them and how hard that is. I know Jenny because I've lived and worked in Australia for several years, and um, one of the projects I got involved with was a biography of Gough Whitlam, and she was the series consultant. She's also a very well-respected academic and, indeed, biographer of Gough Whitlam. Um, Just to fill in, though, a few things for people who don't know much about Australia, we're going to talk about Australian politics. So there's the Labour Party. That's Gough Whitlam's party. That's easy. They're on the left. Then there's the Conservative Party. But just to confuse people, In Australia, that's called the Liberal Party, um, because everything's upside down in Australia, obviously. Um, It's sometimes called the Liberals or the Liberal Coalition or the Liberal National Coalition. Anyway, they were Gough Whitlam's opponents. Um, And the other word we'll hear a lot about is supply, um, because it's a big factor in in what happens. Supply means voting for the sort of financial resources to flow, giving the government money to spend. And... Um, the withdrawal or the threat to supply is what triggers the crisis that um, Jane is going to discuss. Um, I should also say something about Whitlam and his kind of iconic status, um, deeply controversial and divisive figure, loved, revered on the left, seen as one of the great progressive, uh, transformative prime ministers in Australian history. Um, he's only prime minister for, I think, under three years, but he changes so many things about the country. It's like he puts it on fast forward. Um, into the modern age. You know, he gets troops out of Vietnam, he ends conscription, he does amazing things with Aboriginal and Indigenous land rights on equal pay, um, he starts a thing, um, he improves the state-funded health system, introduces electoral reform, no-fault divorce laws. I mean, he's really uh, a force of nature. However, he's also a rather, um, what's the word, um, unusual politician. Um, he doesn't really suffer fools or anybody really. He, he likes to be in charge. He's a big personality. He's a bull in a china shop. He does everything in a great rush. He uses unorthodox methods. And he gets his government into a real economic mess. Or oh, his defenders would say it wasn't just his fault. But um, there's a, the oil crisis of the early 70s is obviously a big factor. But he also he tries to do various slightly dodgy deals, borrowing money from Middle Eastern potentates. And his government comes to a kind of crisis in 1975. Um, And at that stage, half of the parliament's in two houses, like in Westminster. The Senate is controlled by his enemies. They refuse to vote for supply. And so he's kind of like in a stalemate. And that's kind of where we should maybe bring Jenny in. Although, is there any more background you want to explain, Andrew? 
No, I think that's right. I mean, I think the other point is that that the uh, liberals had been in power for many years before that. And so this is a brief moment. But there's some interesting parallels with maybe Liz Trust or Harold Wilson. I mean, uh, trying to get a fix on this. But it's, um, uh, I think you've seen very well. Uh, I think it's a good time to take us on to, to Jenny. Okay, well, we'll pick up after Jenny. And uh, fingers crossed by the magic of Zoom, we'll be able to talk to her in a few seconds. Bye. Bye. Jenny, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Hello, Phil. Hello there, Jenny. Well, I should just say, um, we've just come from our little studio setup to the Zoom in this wonderful new medium called podcasting. Um, <laughs> and we have, in our own very, very amateurish way, kind of sketched out the background to 11th November 1975, the crisis that that, that comes to a fruition on that day. And we thought, given that we only have 30 or 40 minutes with you, you the best use of you might be to A, explain to our listeners, many of whom don't know what happened that day, but then perhaps the more fun part, how the kind of the real story kind of comes out slowly but surely over the years and your role in that. Does, does that seem reasonable? Yeah, that sounds great. Hello, Andrew, by the way. Hello, I, Jenny. Hi, nice to see hello. you. Yes, I'm um, so good. Much how are you? No, no, it's it's a pleasure, always a pleasure. Oh, well, thank you. So there, here we are, a, an overwhelming sense of crisis in Australia. Um, the, 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 the opposition won't vote the money. The government's had to try and borrow it from all kinds of weird places. There's been resignations. There's been angry speeches. The people might not get paid. Um, and there's manoeuvring going on at the highest levels of society. So tell me what happens on that day. Well, it begins actually with on the 11th of November 1975 uh, with Whitlam intending, the Prime Minister Whitlam intending to actually call a half-Senate election. Uh, and that's a critical point here that's often forgotten in the history is that uh, there was only one election which was actually due at that time and it is written in the Constitution in terms of when it's due. And Whitlam had decided that because the uh, uh, the refusal to vote on supply by the uh, opposition conservatives in the Senate had gone on then for four weeks, that he would call that election the half Senate election. So quite properly, he'd raised this over the previous month and had always said, the government had always said, we will call the half Senate election if supply is not passed. Um, it hadn't been voted on. That's an important point. Supply had never been voted on, never been rejected. Um, it just kept going back from the Senate to the House of Representatives with a quite improper demand that the House go to go to an election. So the Senate was going to go to an election that had been discussed with the Governor General for several days. We now know that actually exchanged the paperwork on that. So it was all set. Um, and in fact, it's interesting that as the Prime Minister drove into um, Government House at one o'clock that afternoon to, in fact, hand over the final letter, which he'd approved with the Governor-General that morning, that the uh, the ABC's afternoon uh, public affairs program, PM, had an early edition saying the crisis is over, we're having a half-Senate election right. and we're going to an election. So um, the Governor-General completely unexpectedly uh, simply refused to receive Whitlam's letter, having gone through the wording of it with him just a few hours earlier and said, before you give me that, um, and I don't think there's any dispute about what happened in this conversation at this point, that Kerr held up his hand and said, before you hand me your letter, I have a letter of my own. And face down on his desk was a letter which was already signed, pre-arranged, uh, dismissing the entire government, all of the ministry, which had been elected less than 18 months previously, and said, I'm withdrawing your commission. Um, now, I interviewed Gough Whitlam many times for my biography of him, and he described that moment to me as the greatest shock he had ever experienced. And he said he shook Kerr's hand out of mere habit and in a state of shock and turned and said to him, we will all have to live with this. And... Uh, and Kerr said to Whitlam, we will all have to live with this. And Whitlam replied, you certainly will. <laughs> Goodness. And, and and was... I mean, these days when big political events happen, there's usually rumours, gossip, pre-briefings, things on the internet. And this was 
something must have been going on behind the scenes that they're kept away from Whitlam. Oh, look, absolutely. Secrecy is shot through every part of the dismissal, and it could not have happened if at any point that secrecy had moved beyond rumour. And, of course, there was a lot of conjecture and commentary, et cetera. But the things that took decades to come out are absolutely staggering to think of the extent to which what we now know was a collusive uh, action with several people involved, um, but we were told at the time repeatedly was something that involved only the Governor-General, that he did not speak to others, that he did not seek external advice and that he did not involve others. It was described by veteran journalist Alan Reid, who you'd probably know of, um, as a lonely and agonising decision by the Governor-General. Well, <laughs> we now know it was anything but that many of the people at the highest level of governance, from High Court judges down to the Leader of the Opposition, right through to the Queen's private secretary and Buckingham Palace discussing with Kerr as he moved towards dis dismissing the government. It really is quite a scandalous event in our history. I mean, there's a very famous footage of, of when it's announced on the steps and the crowd, it feels like a kind of proto-revolutionary moment, the anger that so many people feel because Whitlam was idolised by, well, half of Australia at least. Um, and... Do you think if what's known now had been known then, it would not have been proto-revolutionary, it would have been a revolution? Oh, look, I think that's a really important point, Phil. The thing is that had we known at the time of the involvement, for example, of the High Court Justice Anthony Mason, who we now know had met with Kerr for months beforehand and even drafted a letter of dismissal with him, had we known that, 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 that Kerr was writing these voluminous letters to the Queen for months beforehand, raising his concerns about having to use the reserve powers and whether he had the power and being being told that, in fact, he did have the power to dismiss the government using the reserve powers. At the very same time, he's being advised by our Solicitor General and our government and our Attorney General that he had that that power, if it exists, and there's dispute about that, but it certainly had no applicability at that particular point in our political history. So. You know, if any of that had been known, absolutely the, the 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 way in which we understood it and the reaction at the time would have been vastly different. Wow. That's so interesting. I mean, um, we made a <clears> – <throat> you worked on a biography for the ABC. That's the national broadcaster in Australia, where I was very lucky enough to work at the time when it finished, when it went out. Like everything else, um, it had its critics and it had its fans. I was very proud of the show. I thought it was really fair. If, if anything, I thought we – we bent over backwards to be critical of Whitlam, because I think, well, you may disagree, quite a few people we interviewed who had been his allies felt he'd, he'd driven the country into a very dark and dangerous place. But I guess what I didn't know, perhaps even when that show was being made, is that he had his own plan to break the deadlock, to have this other election, and that the dismissal was constitutionally unnecessary, whether it was legal or not. It was unnecessary. So why do you think well, that, it happened? That's that that's um, what what is now much clearer, and interestingly, a, a great deal of the history. And I've written about this in a, a book I wrote a few years ago called "The Dismissal Dossier: Everything You Were Never Meant to Know About November 11, 1975." Precisely because I got so frustrated with a, a range of people, even historians, you know, journalists, people who thought they knew the story, and yet key moments had been left out or distorted or. Um, mis misrepresented in some of the major history books. So I thought it was really important to get in one place what actually happened, what we now know, and work through just what that was. But that that's right, that certainly by the afternoon of November the 11th, 1975, Whitlam went back into the House of Representatives. It's often forgotten, for example, that the House continued to sit. Uh, it, it had risen for lunch. It came back an hour later. Um, Whitlam, of course, had no idea that Kerr had already commissioned the leader of the opposition, who didn't have the numbers in the House, <laughs> to be a new government. And he immediately, um, after about a, a 40 minutes of a you know extraordinary House of Representatives um, sitting, you can imagine the noise. People had just heard that the government had apparently been dismissed and they rushed into the public 
gallery in, in the old Parliament House in Canberra. It's, it's a very low public gallery and they're all leaning over dangerously. There are so many of them. And you can see in the Hansard for that day, which is, you know, I really recommend not very often reading Hansard, but this is actually a very exciting Hansard because two governments are hanging in the balance and people are crying out, you know, people are weeping in the public gallery that this couldn't have happened. And you can see the Hansard transcriber trying to get the, no the, the noise written into the into the formal document uh, with sort of rash, rash and these sort of comments. But um, Whitlam stood up and, and, and proposed a motion of no confidence, a want of confidence motion in the appointed uh, new government of Malcolm Fraser, uh, the Conservative government that had been appointed by uh, the Governor-General. And, of course, that vote succeeded by 10 votes. And the motion effectively a, a, a motion of no confidence in the new appointed government passed by 10 votes. And that same motion called on the Governor-General to recommission a government led by the member for Wera, which is Gough Whitlam. So a motion has been passed, there's no confidence in the House for the new government, and the, and the House of Representatives is calling on the Governor-General to reinstate the Whitlam government. And, of course, supply has already been passed. It was passed that afternoon at about half past two, um, so supplies passed, the crisis is over, the House of Representatives has spoken as to who it wants to form a government. Now, what happened next I call Kerr's second dismissal because the Governor-General refused to accept either the motion or the Speaker from the House of Representatives who was dispatched to go straight to Government House with that motion and inform the Governor-General of the wishes of the House. Um, so it's a it's a second critical moment in the afternoon in which the Governor General says, "I'm not listening to the Parliament. I'm not listening to the People's House. Uh, I am determining the government, not the Parliament." And again, a critical moment in our history. Good Lord! I mean, and I why did he I... do that? Sorry, uh, Jenny. I mean, why did he do that? Look, I think, Andrew, that at that point, the Governor-General, and he has said this, I was determined to stick to the decision I had made, <laughs> So, which is an extraordinary statement. But a second extraordinary statement, which only came out uh, in 2014 when I uncovered in Kerr's papers this remarkable detailing of his months and months of discussions with one of the High Court justices who later became the Chief Justice, Sir Anthony Mason, totally unknown and created an absolute uproar when it was revealed in the second volume of my biography with him, that he contacted the High Court Justice Sir Anthony Mason that afternoon after he'd received notification that the House had voted against his appointed government. And he said to, to the High Court Justice, what am, effectively, what am I going to do? I've got, we've got supply. Our supply has been passed. We have a motion from the House supporting the reinstatement of the Whitlam government. And in truly shocking words, the High Court Justice said to him about this motion, a motion of confidence in the House of Representatives. This is how governments are made and formed across the centuries in Westminster systems. Our High Court Justice, Sir Anthony Mason, said to him that the motion of the House was irrelevant. Why? Wow. And it's absolutely critical. Mason has never denied that. And uh, and it's been written about now extensively. So these are the really troubling elements that, you know, I thought I would not ever be shocked about things about the dismissal of the Whitlam government, but I can tell you when I found that document, I was utterly shocked. And this I had is no idea. You didn't find this out till 2014. Tw sorry, it was 20, 2012 when the first edition of the book came out. 2012. <laughs> and it was you know, clearly decades later, and it was in the archives in Kerr's papers. Now, I was told by the archives subsequently that they had considered very carefully withdrawing my access to publish it after I'd seen it. And, again, that raises real questions about the role of the archives in a lot of this material well, and the failure to release it earlier. This is why I should, I should really step back now and let you and Andrew talk because... The, the really fascinating part of all this, I think, to me anyway, is how both of you actually have struggled to get access to royal-related papers, which, anyway, I, I think you should tell that story because I think it's what our listeners will be fascinated to learn about. 
But I'm fascinated too, Jenny. In in was why did Kerr, Kerr keep these papers? I mean, if he destroyed them, after all, um, it wouldn't have been the same controversy. Well, that's right, and and I think he he kept them, Andrew, because he wanted them to be released. He wanted it to be known publicly that other people had been a part of this yep. uh, general move to dismiss the government. That he had advice, that he had support, as he saw it. He actually, there are many letters in there which make it absolutely clear that he was pleading with High Court Justice Anthony Mason to allow his role to become public. And Mason did not want anyone to know of his role, he said, and not until uh, after all of our debts, which I think is the ultimate cowardice for a public figure paid by public funds for much of his his, his life on the bench and and yet not prepared to be publicly known as someone who secretly advised the Governor-General to dismiss the elected government. So, again, another shock in the archives, I think, from those revelations. So no doubt, and Kerbank's many, many mentions that he wanted that role of the High Court Justice to be known, uh, and he wanted the letters that he exchanged with the Queen through the Queen's private secretary and Prince Charles and Lord Mountbatten, all of them totally supportive, to be public. And he went to Buckingham Palace in I think it's 1979, 1980, asking whether they could come to some arrangement to release these letters. So it's it was always Buckingham Palace preventing us from knowing what our Governor-General was writing to the Queen in the months before the dismissal and, and what the Queen was writing to the Governor-General uh, in reply. Um, and it was, we were told, and publicly we were told, that they were withheld on the wishes of the Governor General Sir John Kerr, but in fact, when I began my legal action, uh, the archives very reluctantly revealed that actually the in instructions of the Queen, as they called it, uh, were what was preventing us from accessing those letters. So let's get this clear: the Kerr's papers were being closed on the on the, on the orders of Buckingham Palace, in effect, uh, which had nothing to do with them. That's right. The things, that in, the, things that in, the things that involved correspondence and communications with the with the monarchy or with the monarch um, and Prince Charles and Mountbatten were closed on the instructions of the Queen. There's also we uncovered an, an overarching view in the archives that anything at all to do with royal family, anything at all, is routinely closed by our archives. Um, uh, uh, for, on what grounds varies depending on what day you ask them <laughs> and even on what terms seem to vary. Sometimes they'd say 50 years, sometimes they'd say until they give us permission to open them. But what our court case found is that none of that is actually legal under the Act. The Act, our Act, the Archives Act in Australia, is in one sense a very democratic one, unlike your Act which allows the Royal Archives to have a life of its own. We make no such distinction. The Governor General's records are not are not remo removed in terms of their correspondence with the royal family, and of course, as you said, Phil, there's no relationship between the Queen and the British system in how we interpret our own archives in Australia. That was critical to our legal case. And so, what were the excuses used by Buckingham Palace? Um, you know, here they use freedom of information exemptions like Section Thirty Seven, but what what were their grounds? Or what were the different grounds, shall we say, that they used? Well, ultimately, it came down to the claim that these letters were personal um, and, you know, personal and private to the Queen and the Governor-General. And that's a classic way in which, you know, as you know well, Andrew, anything to do with the royal family that they want to keep out of the public domain is described as personal. And it's really a wonderfully convenient uh, sort of sophistry that's enabled by the fact that the royal family have this duality. They're both a family, of course, they're personal individuals, they're private individuals, they have a family, but they also have a constitutional position. And what they're doing is sort of fudging the distinction between the two by saying they could keep uh, evidence, if you like, of their political engagements or embarrassing material or anything they don't want in the public domain becomes labelled personal. And this is quite clearly constitutional, isn't it? It's nothing to do with their personal lives, this. Absolutely. And and yet that's what we were told. And I argued at every point, well, this is ludicrous. Mm -hmm. You know, the letters between 
the two people at the apex of a constitutional monarchy, the the Queen and the Governor General, about a dismissal of an elected government, are clearly uh, to do with political and constitutional matters. Um, but we had to mount a legal argument to that effect, really to test what is personal in the context of archives. So I was in this extraordinary position after trying to get these letters for about 10 years from the archives, of course, without success, um, that a group of lawyers, um, I, I, I met one of our wonderful barristers, um, Tom Brennan, SC in Sydney, who'd written a marvellous short piece called Australians Own Their Own History, with which I could only agree, and he argued that these letters should be made public under our Archives Act. And I contacted him and said, look, I completely agree. And he said, come in and see me. And, you know, I left the meeting in his chambers two hours later with the possibility of a legal case being mounted. It was quite an extraordinary and very unexpected moment. So I'm full of gratitude to them. But it's such an important case because it not only opened, we succeeded in the High Court of Australia in a 6-1 decision, and we not only opened those critical letters between the Governor-General and the Queen, but it has set a precedent Certainly in Australia, and I would suggest in other Commonwealth nations, how they deal with royal communications. And it's an opening, really, to chip away at royal secrecy in a way that we just hadn't hadn't been able to do before. And what did you and learn, what, Jenny, from those letters? Um, was there anything truly surprising and revelatory when you finally got your hands on them? Or perhaps there are things you still haven't seen? Oh, look, there's... They're absolutely volcanic, uh, Phil, in the way in which we now need to reassess what we understood the, um, the the dismissal to be. We had always been told in a statement from Buckingham Palace soon after the dismissal that that that, that neither the monarch nor the royal family nor the household had any involvement, any part to play at all in Kerr's decision to dismiss the government. Now. The letters show that to, to be completely untrue, and yet uh, Buckingham Palace released another statement saying exactly that, again, as though none of this had ever happened, uh, within days of the letters being released. I mean, it, it's just preposterous, and it's actually an insult to our intelligence and our history as we now know it. The letters show that they began speaking about the possible dismissal of the, of the government with Kerr two months before he did so. Kerr raised it with Prince Charles in a in a conversation that he had um, with him in September in Papua New Guinea. I had seen references to this conversation elsewhere in Kerr's papers. There were extracts from a few of the letters, only about seven, and I should say there are over 200 letters in total, so there's a massive amount, quite unusual. Um, and so from Kerr's papers, I knew enough to know that these were going to be absolute dynamite, as in fact they, they are, um, and that's why we were able to build a case you know, you can you can see why secrecy is such such a an impossible uh, barrier because you cannot argue that you need to see and ought to see historically documents when you don't know what they are. Exactly. I was I was able to say, look, but I do know what they are likely to be because of a, a range of other documents and quotations from Kerr that I had seen elsewhere in his papers and other papers elsewhere. I'd spent 10 years looking at this and those materials were included in part of our evidence brief, including two chapters from my book, The Dismissal Dossier, that all went up to the court. So we had both the legal argument but we had this very, very solid historical set of documents that went with it. And you talk about the Queen, Mark Batten and Charles being involved. I mean, what were they doing? What were they um, saying? Well, it's really, Andrew, a question of the way in which they engage with Kerr in his own personal concerns about um, whether he had the power to remove the government, and that was first raised um, with um, Charles, Prince Charles, in, as I said, in September uh, 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 when they were all in Port Moresby for the Independence Day celebration for PNG. Whitlam, of course, was there. It's like this sort of Shakespearean tableau of all of the key protagonists from the dismissal are actually there, all secretly talking to one another, um, unknown to Whitlam, of course, who's in blissful ignorance um, uh, during those in, in Independence Day celebrations. Um, and and uh, Kerr expressed to, to Charles 
that he was concerned that if he was moving to dismiss the government, you've got to remember supply hasn't even been blocked at this point. He's flagging something he thinks might happen in a month's time and you've got to ask why on earth is he doing that. But, you know, uh, Charles and later when he relayed this to the Queen's private secretary and the Queen, they all then discussed it, we know that now from the letters, they should simply have said to the Governor-General, we cannot possibly discuss these matters with you. You must be discussing it with your Prime Minister. And this is where the letters show that what was breached was the fundamental responsibility between the Crown and the elected government. To have secret discussions with the Governor-General about a matter like the dismissal of the government was utterly improper and, and, and against the requirements for both political neutrality and the Governor-General being required to follow the advice of, of, of validly elected ministers. So I, I think that's the point at which the palace uh, entered into profound error was by engaging with Kerr in these discussions. And what was the reaction uh, from the palace when this material all came, emerged? It's the reaction they seem to have every time material emerges, which is problematic for them, which is to deny that it says what it clearly does say. And they simply repeated what they had said 45 years earlier uh, following the dismissal, which was that neither the palace nor the palace household had any part to play in Kerr's decision. When there it is in black and white, Kerr actually asking them at one point only weeks before the dismissal, could you let me know if there's any concern for the monarchy about the position of the monarchy in Australia if I, you know, need to use the, the reserve powers? Uh, and, and the final letter before the dismissal addresses that and says, if you do as you must, what the Constitution uh, allows, then you cannot possibly do the monarchy any avoidable harm. In fact, the chances are you will do it good. I find that astonishing. And that's the last letter written before the dismissal five days later. And did you find other examples of interference by, by the Crown, by Buckingham Palace? Well, I think all of these discussions, where they breach that requirement and claim of political neutrality and not being involved in political matters, um, all constitute a part of that. And there's no doubt, as our former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull described it, that, that many of these letters are clearly encouraging Kerr to dismiss the government. Um, and, and, and they are truly startling on, on, on that level. So clearly the palace was a player. They were a player, the key player in Kerr's consideration. He, you know, it's, it's I think, a, a really important indicator of what governors general saw their role as. Hopefully that's changed now. But certainly governors general and state governors saw their role not as one that is relating to and responsible to the elected government of the day, but that one is there to protect and support the monarchy in its position in Australia. And that comes through really strongly uh, from Kerr in the way in which he, uh, as Turnbull describes it, um, you know, this sycophantic grovelling, <laughs> in, in Turnbull's words, you know, extraordinarily deferential and supine in, in seeking the approbation of the palace in every, in every move he makes. He would never have dismissed the government if he felt for a moment that the palace would would uh, uh, would be disdainful of that, would disarm him and would disagree with it subsequently. And it was made very clear to him that, that they would not, and they didn't. Well, I was saying, I, we were saying earlier that <clears throat> within pro progressive circles, if you like, Whitlam was such a uh, was hero worship, really, and he'd done some amazing, rather radical things to do with education, uh, land rights for Indigenous people. Of course, he'd started disengaging from the Vietnam War. Is there a sense, you think, maybe in London, perhaps even in Washington, he wasn't seen as a progressive hero. He was seen as a kind of dangerous radical. And that perhaps affected their judgment? Or was it nothing to do with politics, to do with a kind of clash of personalities, do you think, at the heart of it? Oh, I think it was very much to do with politics, not just because of uh, what became a very reformist agenda, a very successful reformist agenda. But I think the other thing that uh, I've always thought uh, was a critical context for both the Whitlam government and the dismissal was the simple fact that this was the first Labor government in 23 years in Australia and we'd had 23 years of Conservative government 
Um, there was a settled way, almost the entire period of the post-war uh, was settled into that sort of, you know, rubric of Sir Robert Menzies, is the long-serving Liberal Prime Minister. Um, over many years, the public service was locked into this sort of safe, comfortable, unchanging way of doing things, extensive relationships with the UK and with the Australian High Commissioner, of course, um, Sir Alec Downer, into the sort of um, uh, public service Whitehall and close connections with the palace. So there are settled ways of doing things that the advent of a very reformist Labor government, the first in 23 years, really unsettled. And Whitlam, of course, always said that one of his key desires was to end what he called the colonial relics <laughs> in our sort of lingering relationship with Britain. And that didn't go down well when that term was used uh, during various visits to London <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, you know, he wanted to end the Privy Council appeals. There were some, still some states where some cases could go to the Privy Council, which he said was a national humiliation that decisions of our court in Australia could in any way then be taken to a Brit to a court with 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 judges from other jurisdictions and other nations uh, ruling on it. It was absolutely appalling. But that didn't get changed for another 10 years. It was always something he tried to but was stymied at various points, partly by the states. Um, uh, he changed the royal title uh, uh, to shorten it. He, he changed the, uh, we re he removed the British honour system in Australia <clears throat> and introduced the Australian honour system that we still have today, of course, uh, changed the national anthem to uh, to our, what is still our national anthem, Advance Australia Fair, and I can't tell you the amount of angst that gave our Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, in his letters to and from the palace. Should he be allowed to pl still play the national anthem uh, at, at certain events, and would it be for four bars or six? This, this, <laughs> seemed, to, this seemed to exercise him more than more than just about anything else. Ex oh, it except does, it does seem so. We've got probably only about five minutes left, and I, I, I'd love to ask you oh, sorry. For, pe for people who don't know this story, listening to what you've said, and I think the word volcanic is very accurate. They'd be amazed to think that all these years later, Australia is still has the British monarch as a head of state, um, and of course, the new one, Charles is involved deeply in this story. Do you think this still has the potential um, to come back and bite them and give republicanism in Australia uh, uh, some new impetus? Well, Charles is very much involved because of that very critical conversation um, with Kerr that he relayed to the Queen about the prospect of the possible dismissal, uh, but also because he wrote a letter that was only released after my legal action in 2020, um, which was an astonishing letter uh, about six weeks after the dismissal, uh, congratulating Kerr on his action and saying, stay strong, um, because Kerr was considering resigning because of the uproar about it. And he said, uh, you, what you did was the right and proper thing to do. So, you know, we have a letter afterwards very, very strongly from our current head of state um, congratulating the the or at least encouraging the governor general in the correct action, the notion that this was a correct action to take, and it's wow. very similar language to a letter from Mountbatten, which um, uh, Andrew would be familiar with, uh, uh, written only days after the dismissal. Again, congratulating him on his correct and proper action. It is shocking. Government. It really is shocking. So, story. so you know, very much supportive of the action that was taken. And I've been calling for our head of state, the uh, 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 the recently announced King Charles III, to make an apology to the Australian people for ever engaging with our Governor General in those discussions, and for his uh, uh, lack of um, political foresight by breaching neutrality in in encouraging him subsequently in the way that he did. I think he needs to apologise to us and to acknowledge that that sort of political intervention was utterly improper. And has it led to other uh, cases, I mean, uh, of, of interference by the royal, British royal family in Australian affairs? Other stories are emerging or, or so still many of these documents on other issues still closed? Look, they're still closed, Andrew, and that's one of the great uh, worries. I think we need to continue this campaign to open access to royal records. They're a critical part of our history. The only other documents that the archives has now released here and their terrific documents are the same letters between Royal 
uh, between the Queen and six other governors general, and they released them last year in January. And so we've got this fascinating picture of a very uh, a dynamic, changing relationship uh, between governors general and the palace. But what what they they show above all is just how exceptional and uh, and improper the Kerr letters are because of the sorts of things they go into. None of the other letters approach anything whatsoever to do with political matters, only Kerrs, only Sir Martin Charteris, the Queen's private secretary, the Queen and, and, and Charles. There's one occasion when we're having the uh, referendum on a republic in 1999 where the Queen's then private secretary writes to our Governor-General suggesting uh that, 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 that there might be ways in which the Governor-General's office could assist the monarchy <laughs> during the Republic campaign. And thankfully our government house was horrified and, uh, and made it very clear that this was not a proper, a proper thing to raise with them, which, of course, is what should have happened in 1975 and did not. But just because they haven't been released doesn't mean there isn't more material, presumably. I mean, they've been very selective, presumably, in what they've released. Oh, look, all of those governors general's letters, the ones that were only more recently released, have been heavily, heavily redacted. And guess who they consulted about the redactions? Buckingham Palace. And I think given our um, High Court ruling, that is absolutely scandalous. The, the one body that should not be consulted is the British royal family over over whether there are valid redactions under the Australian Act? It's got nothing to do with the British Act. But and in terms redacted of the, by Australian archivists. Yes, yes. So, so what you see when they're released is huge pages that are either blank or blacked out or simply missing. But in terms of the Whitlam dismissal, there are still masses of files that are missing. All of the Government House uh, guest books for 1975 have disappeared. Neither Government House nor the archives seem to have them. Um, uh, there was a, a box of, uh, of very significant supportive letters that Kerr had left with the official secretary at Government House and letters show between them where Kerr is asking for them, show that uh, Government House claims to have inadvertently burnt this highly significant box of letters that Kerr was wanting to have with him, take with him and possibly use and release because they're very supportive from significant individuals. One of them was uh, Mountbatten's letter and he could not get a copy of Mountbatten's letter uh, for that reason. <laughs> so this is, we are, We're we're going to be cut off by Zoom in a minute because Andrew and I are too mean to have a proper Zoom account, <laughs> yeah. the honest truth. So we have but to say goodbye. Terrific. It's been so interesting. I wish we had more time. And can I just thank you? It's a lovely, warm summer evening. In, is it Melbourne? It certainly is. It's been 40 degrees today, so oh. you're right. It has been. It is a lovely, warm evening. Well, thank you for taking the time in your lovely, warm summer evening to join us in our cold, frosty London morning. Really appreciate it. And I've certainly learned a lot. Delightful. I'll speak to That's you soon. a very important case. And, and let's more hope power, it leads more to power change. to your researchers. Keep thank you. Thank you both. Thank you Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Well, well that was pretty extraordinary, wasn't it? Yeah. What do you make of it all? Incredible. Well, I mean, I think it's really interesting. There she is calling uh, King Charles to apologise. I mean, we've really got a very strong uh, sense of how this story is continuing to play out. Uh, and I think it really raises some very interesting questions about whether we could really be pushing for some more records to be released, uh, certainly in the archives of, of other members of the Commonwealth. Yeah, I think people knew that there had been correspondence between the Queen's private secretary and Kerr leading up to the dismissal. I think that's probably been out there for some years. But I didn't, I knew not, I thought I knew a lot about this. I knew nothing about Charles's direct support and encouragement for Kerr. That's kind of, yeah. I don't know. What do you think, Skip? Is that Skip? Skip says, stop behaving like a bloody child, Phil. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, the stories <laughs> continue. I mean, yeah, I, I think, I mean, there's so much more to the story than I think we realised. And I think there was probably very little coverage here. And the story, I mean, the fact that, the, you know, even as, as late as a couple of years ago, they were releasing letters uh, and letters credit to other governor generals, I think is very interesting. Is this, but how can we be sure that it's the full story? Well, well you know a lot um, about this with all your struggles to get access to the Mount Batten papers. It seems if something's really embarrassing, one tactic that the powers that be could use is just to play it very long, you know, if these letters had been available a week after the dismissal, it could have caused such trouble. But it's 40-odd years. 
And, you know, maybe the, the delaying tactic actually is effective. Oh, it's very effective. And it's very effective, I mean, to uh, just keep kicking the can down the road until people just give up trying to ask for stuff and lose the will to live. Uh, they can find all sorts of excuses uh, not to show things. Uh, and then even when you do get uh, something opened, you can find it so heavily redacted as to be totally worthless. Uh, so, uh, you know, one wonders if we do still have the real story. And I think what is also very revealing is that the palace continued to deny the sense their role afterwards when it was clearly plainly obvious that they had been actively involved in this right from the very beginning. It sounds like Kerr was a little bit keen himself to get this fact out. He was maybe a little embarrassed. He had to continue to live in Australia. He was, after all, an Australian, a proud, patriotic Australian. He thought he'd done the right thing. But it seems like he wanted the world to know that he'd been given green light from London. Um, yeah, well, that's just... Under- Understandable. I mean, he'd taken the taken the the sort of the the, the uh, he he'd, he'd been in the firing line, and everyone else had kind of disappeared, and he was left to take the flak. Um, you know, I, I, I you can quite understand why he would feel that way. Um, and I think the fascinating thing is too the way that the the Queen uh, and to a lesser extent Charles hid behind private secretaries. There's always a fall fall guy, even on their side, who can take the blame and they had nothing they knew nothing about it, when clearly they were very closely b- briefed on the situation. Mm, interesting. So and um, Charles, of course, has had a quite a long and complex history with Australia. He went there as a student, supposedly mm-hmm. didn't really like it. He goes there with Diana early in the marriage. She's a huge success. He seems to be a little bit, it's been said, sort of sulky and a little bit difficult during that tour. We talked about this on our Diana program. Um, He's supposed to have said various disparaging things about Australia over the years. I don't know if it's true or apocryphal. But, you know, um, and I'm not sure he's ever ever been there with Camilla. I wonder if he has, Um, because they were so into Diana down under. Um, You know, he's got a Well, I think there's a a tour planned uh, at some point, because I think they're very keen, clearly, to stop Australia becoming a republic. Uh, And in some ways, this story blows up again. Uh, That may add some fuel to anti-monical feelings. Well, I think it probably will. I don't don't know how you feel. I mean, in terms of Britain, I've sort of softened over the years. I used to be quite a fierce republican. I'm kind of more relaxed about it now. But from the perspective of Australia... Or New Zealand, it does seem bonkers, doesn't it? That the head of state is decided by an accident of birth on the other side of the world. Eventually, you have to think they'd move on. They can still be part of the Commonwealth if they want to be as a republic. Well, I think also the sense that you know judicial decisions, there's a higher court than the Australian courts that they can go to. You know that doesn't suggest that they've got great deal independence. So I think there's still a lot of issues that that this this case has raised that um, I suspect at the time of the coronation will be raised again. Well, maybe we should fly out there and do some outside broadcasts. Live well, I know you're going to be there, going to be seeing Jenny, and I think, yes, who knows? You could become the man who brought down the monarchy in Australia. Oh, goodness. Well, I don't know what my mother would have said about that. She would have disowned me. Um, she was a bit of a monarchist herself. Well, I think we're probably done. Is there anything else you want to add? I mean, I can wave no, that flag again. All no, I would we? say is, is, you know, this has sort of given me the idea that historians should be pressing for archives in other Commonwealth countries that relate to to the royal family, because if they don't really come under the, the, the legislation here, which, of course, prevents us from seeing things, then this may be a way through the back door of getting access to uh, discovering more about the Queen's reign. I mean, there's 70 years that we just don't know about, uh, which is very important to, to to our history and clearly would be to their history. Actually, I should just ask you, um, Jenny, I don't think it cost her any money to go to the courts to get what she wanted from the archives. Well, of course, as people know, a lot of people, if you don't know, you should. It cost Andrew a great deal of money to do something similar here. Why was that? Well, I mean, she was very lucky. She got pro, no, pro bono um, uh, lawyers to work from her from the very beginning. I think she knew that this was a test case. Uh, my case sort of grew. And though I, for the first few years, did it all myself, I was forced, because the government brought in high-powered lawyers against me, to employ lawyers to rebut what they were doing. Uh, and indeed, we took at one point the cabinet office to court uh, before even the hearing. Uh, and, and threatened the South, University of Southampton with contempt of court proceedings. I couldn't have done that on my own. And unfortunately, those lawyers 
gave me a cut charity rate, but they they were still pretty expensive. I thought that we would get our expenses, our legal costs back, because in the end, 99% of the material was released. There had been unreasonable behaviour, but for whatever reason, the tribunal didn't do that. Now, I've just been given leave to appeal, so it's the first stage in trying to, to get my costs. And if I'm given leave, then we will bring a case. But there is the danger, and that's on a on a contingency fee arrangement. So I may well see all my uh, all the money that's won back going to the lawyers again. But at least it, it keeps the, the the story going, and uh, it'll be interesting to see whether the government does fight this. They've spent probably over a million pounds trying to suppress material which they then released. Uh, whether they'll fight that or they'll just throw in the towel and say, "Yeah, you've, you're you've, you're okay now. You can have your money back." Well, there might be a different government in Britain by the time it comes to court. Well, I think that's very true. Exactly. Uh, I mean, it's a good case for how things are, are kicked down the the road. Uh, with my Mountbatten case, the decision notice from the Information Commissioner was in November two thousand and nineteen, but the Cabinet Office managed to um, uh, delay any sort of hearing until November twenty twenty one. And they use the excuse of COVID and other things, homeschooling, and even though there were clearly Zoom Zoom tribunals going on, so that's what they do. Uh, they they just uh, play it as long as they can, and as you say, situations may change. Well, you know, I'm I'm so glad from Jenny's perspective that she was able to achieve what she achieved. I do think that some of the things she's saying now could well light the blue touch paper under the uh, under the upcoming coronation, and maybe our little. Podcast when it's when it goes out in a couple of days, we'll play a part in that. Let's see. I very much hope so. All right. Take care, Andrew. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandal Mongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandal Mongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 